Hello and welcome everybody to ALC at Home. This is our online service here at Abundant Life Church. My name's Lewis and this is Hannah yes. and we're part of the team here and we're going to navigate you through the service today. But as we get into things, keep in, we're going to give you a few notices. Yep. We're going to yeah. have a um, little time of worship by hearing scripture and then get into the message as we continue the series on the book of Ruth. But as we get into it, Hannah. Are you yes. ready for 2024? I am so ready. <laughs> Has it been a good year so it's, far? It's been a good year. I always feel like January is the longest month and then it just shoots over till December. I don't yeah, know how. Right. Are, you yeah. are you ready for your last year of year? I am more than ready. It's eight months. I finish in October, start I think just before March starts. So eight months, I'm ready for it to be over. Yeah. <laughs> Hannah's um, starting to be a counsellor. Yes. So she can talk to you about all your problems. I can. She, she does it for me already. <laughs> I've got lots, but yeah, that's awesome. Get excited, yes. we'll be praying for you through the rest of this Thank year. Thank you, I do appreciate all your prayers. But I have a question for you, Lewis. I yeah. wanted to check in on you, do a bit of counselling if we need to. Are you still getting bullied by your chicken at home? Yeah, if you remember a few weeks ago, um, in one of our past videos, I gave an update on my summer, and uh, one of my chickens had been charging at me. Um, everything in life's been going well, but a chicken just kept charging and biting me. And I have a natural fear of birds. Um, so to have a chicken that attacks you, not the greatest thing, <laughs> no. but no, we are fine. I pick her up, I give her cuddles again, nice. and uh, she's all good. That's so, good. Praise Glad Jesus to hear that. <laughs> hey, we would love to hear how your year has started off as well. So leave a comment below uh, what you've been up to in your January. We are into February now. Um, so how's your year started off? We would love to hear that. For you but also if you do have any other questions to do with online or even ALC maybe you're watching and you want to come join us in person um, if you have any questions feel free to email them to info at alc.org.nz and one of us will definitely be in touch with you but we do have a couple of notices today don't we yeah absolutely yeah you know, we, we, I just will say that this year there's gonna be a lot of exciting mm -hmm. things I've been looking at my calendar and what's come up there's exciting things so if you're ever in the area Wellington yeah. New Zealand or close to that now is two hours drive feel free to come and visit us any Sunday you yes. are welcome here. if you live overseas you want to make a holiday great holiday destination yes. and come and Beautiful. visit us as well uh, we've got a spot waiting for you would love for you to join us so feel free um it's going to be an exciting year i know that much yes. but also we encourage you in this time as if you've been watching for a while if you've seen our videos or even if you go back and see some of our videos we have q a videos where pastor hamish will answer questions people like you people like me have asked Mm. asked and they have been answered mm. by him yeah. and it's a great way to be encouraged and challenged and even people have questions for us so if you have any questions about anything the sermon the series life faith um anything at all feel free to go into slido.com on any web browser with the hashtag alc24 i'll give you a place to put it and then you will be able to ask the questions and then Pastor Hamish will answer them over the next few weeks. So I encourage you to do that, ask away and let's see them answered together. Mm -hmm. And you can watch them on our YouTube channel, usually two come up a week, so just keep an eye out and have a look at that. I do believe that's most of that our is, notices. Yes. I know that if you do have any prayer requests, we love to pray with you. Um, so feel free to email us at prayeralc.org.nz and one of our team will pray with yes. you on that. I th I, yeah, we're going to yeah. get into this worship time now. We um, we, what we do, what do we do, Hannah? What we do things a little bit different, differently here online. You know, um, there's different types that we get to come together and worship. But today we are going to worship through scripture. I think um, it is amazing to hear the promises of God and the truth that comes out of his word. And to just declare that over us, I think, is a great way to worship. So this morning, I encourage you, as um, there's a scripture that's shared with you next, to just um, really ask the Holy Spirit to open up your hearts um, and give you the room and the space to declare those promises over your life as well. And then we are going to week two, I believe, of the Ruth series. I have definitely loved it. I have been able to hear some of it as well. So it is going to be so good. I know that. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Well, let's get into it today. Let's come draw closer, get your notebooks out, have our open heart to what yes. God wants to say. And we just know we're here for you, we're with you, and let's grow together. Yeah. Let's do it. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. Psalms 37 verses 23 to 24. 
Hey, welcome to ALC Online. It's so good to have you with us as we open up the scriptures in order to be strengthened again in our faith and our hope and our love. Uh, if you were with us last time, welcome back. It's good to have you as we uh, go through this book of Ruth, as we journey through it to to get some insights into how we can navigate some of the, the complexity, some of the struggles of life that that happen, don't they? Hey, and if you're visiting with us, if you've just um, stumbled across us, hey, welcome. It's good to have you with us. ALC is a community of hope in the capital city of New Zealand, uh, and it's good to have you with us because it's my hope and my prayer that as we just spend a few moments opening up the Book of Ruth, that, that no matter where you are in life, that you will find a key that will help you uh, take another step, whether it be a step of faith because you uh, worship God or whether it be a step toward God because you're trying to make sense of faith and life and how does this whole thing fit together. So uh, good to have you with us. Hey, but uh, if you are new or whether you or perhaps you're not familiar with the book of Ruth, uh, we're doing the book of Ruth because I just think it has so much to, to say to us in, in our context today. Uh, it's just so theologically rich and deep in terms of insights into to how to make sense of life and live live a faith-filled life, live a faith that is not determined by circumstance, uh, a life that is, that is uh, pregnant and, and full of hope in ways that, that just going with the flow don't. And it's a book that helps us navigate through some of the, the frustrations, disappointments, and, and, and some of the challenges that come our way. You know, there's a there's this thought among some people that the moment you become a Christian, then, then life's going to become a, a bed of roses. And if you've been walking with the Lord for a while, you know that's not so. <clears throat> you know that being a Christian doesn't absolve us from, from the difficulties of life, from the frustrations, from, from the pain and, and from all of those sorts of things. All it does is give us a perspective to, to walk through life uh, in ways that our sense of well-being and purpose is not determined by our circumstance, uh, but is a reflection of our relationship with God. And we're picking the story up in the book of Ruth right at that point, because I think so often what happens is that that when your life and, and my life, certainly, uh, my experience has been that, that there's been times when I've just felt the pressure crowding in. You know, I felt financial pressure, the mortgage to pay and, and bills are piling up and, and I'm, I'm not getting any more money coming in. There's relationship problems, there's, there's all sorts of issues and you feel them coming in and, and, and you reach a point where it's almost overwhelming and you think, I've, I've got to do something. And the temptation at that point is to step out and to, to write our own ending, to, to write a new chapter for ourselves uh, and, and our story. And... The sad thing is, so often when that happens, we miss the best parts of life because we're no longer uh, tracking in our story that God's written, but we're trying to make a new one for ourselves. And whenever we write our own story, it's never going to be as exciting. It's never going to be as fulfilling as the story that God has for us. So with that in mind, let's jump in. We are at uh, Ruth chapter 1, beginning at verse 8. Remember last week we looked at this, the opening, uh, well, in fact we looked at all chapter 1 except for the verses we're looking at today, this conversation between Naomi and her two daughters-in-law. Um, and, and the story really is about how Naomi and her husband Elimelech and their two sons left their home, left what is familiar, what is safe uh, in Bethlehem where they came from. They, they were uh, Hebrews. Because there was a famine and they, in the midst of that famine, did what you and I would do, where they just thought, you know what, the best thing for us right now, the, the logical thing to do is, is not to stay where there's nothing, but to go where there's something. And so they went to Moab, which was a country that was um, not conducent to them and to their faith necessarily. They'd been sort of enemies, if I could describe it that way. But there's food there. So they go to secure for themselves what they felt was missing where they were. And we picked the story up. They'd been there about 10 years. We don't know at what point the sons had got married, but we know that uh, Naomi's husband had died. Uh, and that left you vulnerable. In those days, to be a widow meant that you were vulnerable. Uh, there was no security. You were destitute uh, because there was no one looking out for you. You were the lowest of the low in that sense because there was no family around. And, and even her sons had died in quick succession as well. So she was, in, she was <clears throat> and basically at the mercies of, of, the, of 
society and it, the Bible tells us that people were doing what seemed right in their own eyes. They weren't worried about the welfare of others. They were just worried about themselves. And so she makes a determination to, to go back to her home because she's heard that the famine is over. And, and as she goes... There's, an, there's this little conversation between her and her two daughters-in-law, which I think speak volumes to us, to encourage us to, in the midst of hardship, in the midst of frustration, in the midst of the pain of life, to stay. Not just simply to endure for endurance sake, but to stay so that God can do something incredible. And in the midst of that, it's my hope that wherever you find yourself today, that you're going to be encouraged. So let's jump in, uh, Ruth chapter 1, beginning at verse 8. On the way, Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back to your mother's, home, uh, mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husband and to me. To your husbands and to me. She's praying God's blessing on them. There's no ill will on Naomi's part here. She genuinely wants what's best for them because she loves for them. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. She, she genuinely cares about their welfare. She's praying and releasing them. <clears throat> then she kissed them goodbye and all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. You see that Naomi and Oprah are, are loyal to Naomi. They love her. They respect her. And, and so they, they want to go with her. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who would grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? You see, that back in these days, because a woman's security, her protection, her her, her, her well-being was because of her husband. That There was a, a practice called the Leverite um, marriage whereby if you, your husband died, then you would marry his next sibling because that would provide you security. It would provide you um, rest. It would, it would give you what you needed in, a, in that type of culture. And you would keep on going down the line until one of the, uh, one of the siblings uh, was in a position or wanted to marry you. And what she's saying is here, I can't do that for you. I have no more sons. And even if I get married and, and, um, and I bear sons tonight, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry anyone else? Would you risk your future? Would you risk your security and, and everything else? Of course not, she says. Um, Things are far more bitter for me than for you because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. She genuinely believed that the bitter circumstances of her life were the result of God toward her because of decisions that she had made, because of um, things that uh, she had done in her life. And she wanted to spare her daughters and all that. She said, you don't have to stay in my story. My story is one of bitterness. My story is one of hardship. My story is one of, of, of loneliness, of uncertainty. Go back home and find yourself a husband who can give you what I can't. And, and, and that's what she's encouraging them to do. And what I find there is that really interesting is that she is praying God's blessing upon them. And asking God to watch over them, to, to, to give them a marriage and everything else. But she's sending them back to Moabite gods. It's this whole thing that I mentioned last time that when life is crowding in and we feel that it's not fair, when we feel God is not listening or not responding, or when we know that God is great and he could do something, but he hasn't. What happens in those times of pain, those times of frustration, um, those, those times of, of loneliness, is we still proclaim God's good, greatness, but we doubt his goodness. God, I know you're great. I'm just not seeing goodness in my life. So we don't, we don't doubt that God is, God is great, that he can do all things. We just don't expect to experience it in our lives. And I think that's what's going on here. God, I know that you can. And so I'm, I'm trusting you. You're the God of, you're the God of God's. And so I'm, I'm asking your blessing on Oprah and Ruth. But she doesn't think that he's going to come through. So she sends him back to what is familiar. And even though, um, even though 
Oprah and Ruth push back against her. Um, she, she, she says, them, no, you've got to do the right thing. You've got to do the logical thing. You, you've got to do the thing that, that makes best sense. And right now, I can't give you security. I have no hope. God's hand is against me. There's nothing here that I can give you that you need. The right thing, the logical thing is to go back home and find for yourself husbands who, who will look after you, who will protect you, who will give you a hope and a future. And so it's decision time for Orpha and for Ruth. So what do they do? Again, they weep together and Orpha kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung tightly to Naomi. Now, it's really easy as we read the scripture to contrast Orpha and, and Ruth and think, well, Orpha took the easy way out and, you know, she wasn't she didn't have the same heart, whatever, uh, as Ruth. I don't think the writer of the book of Ruth um, puts them in the same sentence like this to compare them and say one's better than the other because Orpah loves her mother-in-law. She, she begs to, be, to stay, but because she respected her and loved her, when Naomi said, no, the best thing for you, the right thing to do, the logical thing for you is to go back home. Even though she wanted to go with her, she obeyed. She respected her. She loved her and honored her and did what she asked of her. She went back home. Whereas Ruth takes a radical step of faith. And I think the purpose of this really is to help us understand the difference between faith and reason. Because you see, when, for most of us, when we feel um, the pressure mounting in our lives, when, when we're faced with disappointment, when we're faced with decisions that, that we're unsure about, the struggle really is, do we follow reason or do we follow faith? Do we do what is right, what, what, what seems best, what is reasonable, what is logical? Or do we follow faith? Do we, do we trust God enough to stay when everything says go? Do we trust God enough to, to keep going through what we're going through when everybody else says, here's a way out? Here's, here's, a, here's an avenue that you can go down and you can, you can write a new chapter in, in your story. That's really what it's about. And at its heart for for Orpah and for Ruth is really this. Do I have God, but with nothing else in Bethlehem? Or do I have everything, but without God in Moab? That was the choices that they were facing. Do I have security and, and peace and, and protection um, that comes from another husband, from a Moabite husband and, um, back home? Or do I trust God to, to provide for me, to look after me? Um, do I risk everything? I, I have nothing. I have no future as it stands. There's no reason. There's no logic. I just, I have God with nothing in Bethlehem. Or do I uh, have, go back home to what is familiar, what is safe, but without God? That's really the decision. And, and it's the decision that often you and I face in, in life too, isn't it? When reason and faith um, appear to conflict, the temptation is, do I risk everything and follow God? Or do I hold on to my security? Do I hold on to, to what, is, what, what, what seems right, what feels right, um, and put my feet down and say, God, I love you, but that's, that's the tension that we have. And it's true in your life and mine that when we, feel the, when we feel pressured, when we feel like life is not going where we thought it would, when we feel that, that God is not listening, that God hasn't come through, that our prayers have not been answered, where our, our desires have not been met, where expectations have, uh, have been disappointed, this is the struggle that you and I have. And I like the way that we see that Naomi, in her audacious faith, clings tightly, uh, Ruth, sorry, in her audacious faith, clings tightly to Naomi. Um, she, it's the same word that we read about in Genesis 2.24, where it says, um, when it, we talk about marriage, the first, the instituting of marriage, and it says that a man will leave his family and cleave or cling to his wife. In other words, giving up what is familiar, what is safe, what is known, and risking all that to make something new, to, to do something different. And, and that's really the faith that she's having. I'm going to risk everything because I trust you, Naomi. 
I'm going to risk everything because I trust your God. It's the it's same word that we see in the Old Testament again and again when God invites us into a covenantal relationship. It expresses permanence. It expresses commitment. It, exp- it means holding fast no matter what. And that's what she's, and that's what she's saying to Naomi. Yet one more time, Naomi tries to, to, um, to dissuade Ruth. And she says, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. You should do the same. Ruth, I love you and I, I want what's best for you. But your hope is back home. There's no hope for you with me. There's no future going where I'm going. Because I have none. God has given up on me. But go back. Who knows what might happen? And look at her response. This is probably one of the most well-known passages in Ruth. Even if you're not a, a, a regular in church or read the Bible, you've probably heard people quote this. Ruth says, Don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I'll be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. In other words, she was speechless. She was speechless at Ruth's commitment to choose uncertainty, to choose hopelessness, to choose bitterness over security and rest back home. And so instead of leaving, Ruth not only chooses to stay, but she enters into a, into a covenantal relationship, not just with Naomi, but with God, the God of the Bible and his people. She, she, what she's doing is she's renouncing her culture, her identity, um, everything that has made her and determined her and, and given her a sense of, of purpose and everything else about her and life thus far. And she says, God, I'm going to choose you. It's a radical decision that she's made because conversions didn't really happen in those days because your sense of identity, everything about you is determined by your culture and, and, and the gods of that culture. And so to renounce them was to, to turn your back on everything. And yet that's exactly what she's doing. She's taking a huge leap of faith and saying, I'm going to trust Naomi's God in the midst of of the unknown rather than have everything for myself. Clearly she saw something in Naomi's life and the way that she worshipped, the way that she talked about God that, uh, that spoke to her. And as a consequence, um, she, she made that decision. And she doesn't just say, Naomi, I'll stick around uh, until you die. I'll, I'll give you my best years until you die, and then I'm going to go back home. She says, I'm all in. So long as there is breath in my lungs, I'm all in. Long after you die, I'm going to remain committed to, to your God and, and to your people. Even if I don't get married, even if I don't have security, even if life is hard for me, I'm going to stay in this story because I'm going to trust God no matter what. My future is not my circumstance. My future lies in the one who knows tomorrow as I were yesterday. And that's faith. That's audacious, radical faith. And and can I just pause for a moment there? And, you know, I've talked about this before, if you've tracked with us for a while, about how people have to see Jesus before they'll follow him. The reason I'm I'm big on that is is simply this, that Ruth was a Moabite. Um, She knew all about her gods and and they had their their stories and and they they had their traditions around them and everything else. But when she married Ruth's son, she was marrying into another culture, into another religion. And she would have heard Ruth, I think, talking about about Yahweh, the God of the Bible, and, and, and how when Israel was enslaved and there seemed no hope and no way out. He came to their rescue, parted the Red Seas and led them out. About how when they were in the wilderness and there was no water, the the rock gave it forth. And I think she heard all of these stories of the greatness of God and His goodness and the way that, that when there seems no hope, He suddenly created something out of nothing and made a way for them. And I think that that is what enabled her to say, you know what, I don't know where this is going to go, 
but I'm going to, I'm going to believe in Yahweh. And I say that because here's the thing. People, you, people who don't know God know you. The people that you know that don't know God, they know you. And they're looking at how you do life. And how you do life is going to shape how they begin to view God. If they know you're a Christian, they're looking, do you respond the way we do? Or do you respond differently? Does the way you talk about life reflect the way we talk about it, Or is there something in you? Are you more hope-filled? Do you speak in ways that point beyond what is? Do you speak in ways that there's something that, about you that stirs something in us? This is why it's important to stay in the story. Why I said courage, sometimes courage means staying in the midst of pain and uncertainty. And finding peace, not in your circumstances, but in the God who holds all things together. Because it's before all things. And in Him, all things are held. You see, they're watching you. They're watching how you respond to adversity. How you respond to pressure. How you respond to, to what's happening in life. And it's going to have an influence on them. And, and I say that because it helps us make sense of, of how to apply this uh, in our daily lives. If we're going to, to be people of faith, if we're going to be hope carriers in, in a world that is desperately looking for meaning and purpose beyond the, the divisive politics and ideologies of this world. The two things that, that I've been thinking about that are really helpful for us. The first is simply this. In the midst of pain, in the midst of whatever you're going through, and I don't know what you're going through, maybe your life is really hard for you at the moment. You're, you're in a marriage which just, you feel so bereft, so alone, so, so cut off. There's no love, there's no warmth, there's no affection. Maybe you've lost a loved one. Maybe you feel trapped in a dead-end job. Maybe you're at a stage of life where so many of your dreams have, have, have just seemed to have died and you're not married or... You're married, but you don't, you're not, you don't have a family yet. And you just think, what do I do? And the temptation is to leave, to, to, to rewrite the story for yourself, to step out of where you are into something new and write another chapter for yourself. Can I just encourage you? Resist the temptation to leave. Don't run when life gets hard. Don't, don't look for ways out. I know it can be difficult. I know it can be frustrating. I know it can be lonely and, and all those things. But Ruth shows us that in those times, that's when we need to stay, to trust God, even when it seems illogical, even when it doesn't make sense and it's unreasonable, because it's always better to choose Jesus and nothing than everything minus Jesus. Because when Jesus is in our camp, it changes everything. Jesus is more than enough. Jesus is more than enough. You know, <clears throat> Jesus has already chosen you. And that's why you can stay in the story, because he's chosen you. On the cross, he made a decision. I'm staying in, in your sin. I'm staying in the pain and the mess of your life on the cross so that you can be free from it. The second take home for me from this is, is simply this. To remember that God always writes a greater ending. I know that, that life might not be easy for you at the moment. I don't know what stage of life you're at, but may, maybe you've come to a point you think, is this all my life is going to be like? Is this all there is? Uh, maybe you're wrestling with disappointments, frustrations, and you can't see a way out. Don't leave the story. Recognize that God always writes a better ending. You know, I know that when you're going through hardship, when you're going through frustration, when you're going through deep disappointments, when it feels like God isn't listening, when he's inattentive and disinterested in you, and it feels like he's, he, he doesn't care. I know it can be hard to look beyond the pain, but remember that God always writes a better ending for your story than you will ever be able to write for yourself. You see... <clears throat> If you're a Christian, if you're like me, you've, you've read the end of the, uh, uh, the Bible. You've, you've read the end of the story. You know how it finishes. You know that there will come a time when there'll be no more death, no more sickness, no more pain, when every tear will be wiped away. Christ will reign supreme in glory and he will hold every injustice. He will hold every atrocity. He will hold every act of evil. Every perpetrator of human violence will be held to account. 
And at that time, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. This is the ending of our story. It's a glorious ending where we will stand with God for eternity in heaven, where everything will be perfect. That's the ending that God has for your story. But to get there, you've got to go through some things. You see, the temptation is to quit because our enemy knows that in the very act of quitting and trying to write a new, a new chapter for ourselves, we end up writing a different ending. And God's ending is always better than ours. Always. I've read the end. I know how it finishes for me. And nothing that I can go through between now and eternity is going to, is, is worth sacrificing the end of the story for. I'm not going to forfeit that to give up, to step out, to, 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 give, to walk out of something. I'm going to, I'm going to trust the one who works all things to good for those who love him and for trust him. It may not make sense, but I'm going to trust him. I love Hebrews chapter 12. In verse 1 we read, Therefore, since we're surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that show, slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up, and let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. In chapter 11, the writer has talked about the great heroes of faith who didn't give up in their, in their story, in their race. When logic and reason would have said to. I'm so grateful that Daniel didn't listen to the voice of reason that would have said, look, just don't pray in public and you'll be spared the lions. I'm so grateful that Moses didn't listen to the logic that says, just don't get involved. It's common sense. Don't get involved in the life of your people and the hardship. Enjoy the privileges of the palace so that later on you may be able to do something. You know, I'm so grateful that Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego didn't listen to the voice of of reason that says, hey, just bow down because you know in your heart what you believe and the God knows what's in your heart. It's, it's just bowing down. It's going to spare you that, that, that fiery furnace. You know, I'm so glad that these ones didn't give in. These are the heroes of faith. And the writer says that now in your race and mine, as we, our story is unfolding, they're surrounding us, cheering us on, cheering you and saying, don't give up. We know the end that God has for you. So don't give up. And, and I like what they say. So strip off every weight that slows you down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. I like that. It's not just sin that's going to, to try and take us out of our story that God has, has, us, has planned for us. But it's also, there, there are these weights, if I could describe it that way. You see, it's not just sins that rob us of, of faith. It's those things that weigh us down. They're morally neutral. There's, there's nothing wrong with them in and of themselves, but nevertheless, they keep us from God. Things like dreams, things like um, reason, things like expectations. See, anything that's going to keep weighing you down and hold you back from staying in the race, from staying in your story. Strip it off. Be like Ruth. Don't do what, don't follow wisdom and reason and what is right in the eyes of the world. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Cast things, those things off and don't give up. And how do you not give up when the temptation is to give up? He says, keep your eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. Now he's seated in the place of honor beside God's throne. In other words, keep focused on Jesus, who's going to lead you through the hardship, who's going to lead you through the, whatever it is that, that you're struggling with right now. Whatever you're going through, he's saying... Keep your eyes on me because I endured the cross so that you would not have to. As hard as it is, know that I've made a way for you. I've made a way for you. Jesus took your pain on the cross. Jesus took your frustrations, your disappointments, your hurts. He took your story upon himself so that you wouldn't have to take these things. 
so that you could have the story that God planned for you, that you would be free from the, from the weights and, from the, and, and the temptation to sin. The cross makes it worth it. When we look at what Jesus did, it allows us to trust God to write a better ending than we could for ourselves. And so as, as we sort of wrap things up, this is why the book of Ruth, I think, is so, so inspirational for us today. It shows us what happens when we don't ignore reason, but we say, you know, when reason and faith are in conflict, we choose faith. We choose to trust God, even when it doesn't make sense. We cling to God, even when it doesn't make sense. Even when our heart is hurting because of disappointments. Even in that marriage that seems so cold and, 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 and you just feel so alone. When you cling to Jesus, He's going to lead you and He's going to do something incredible. Those arms that long to hold a child that, have ne- that, that it just seems impossible. God's going to satisfy the desires of your heart. It may not be with a child, but the longings are going to find fulfillment in ways that you can't begin to imagine or conceive because God always writes a better ending than you could write for yourselves. So let me ask you, where are you struggling? And what's one step that you can take so that you won't give up? What's one step that you can take so that you won't give up? Maybe you're... You've resolved this for yourself, and, but you know people who are struggling. Why don't you get alongside of them and say, you know what, I want to help you. I know the temptation is to give up, is to quit, but I want you to stay. I want you to see this through because I believe God has so much more for you. Walk with them through it. And hey, if there's no one like that in your life, why don't you drop me a line, hamish at alc.org.nz. I would love to, to get in contact with you. Uh, e- even if you're not living here uh, in, in New Zealand or in Wellington, I, I'd still like to just form a relationship with you. Um, over the internet, we can, I can pray for you. I want to encourage you because God has a better ending for your story than you can see right now. God has so much more for you than you can imagine or conceive. That's, God's, that's the hope that we have through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I hope that that encourages you wherever you find yourself. Uh, so we're going to wrap it up there and we're going to carry on in chapter 2 next week. But uh, until, until next time, God bless and let me pray for you. Father, thank you for those, Lord, who in the midst of the difficulties, the frustrations, the pain of life, who are just perhaps even just holding on. I thank you that you've seen them. And I thank you that you're reaching out to them right now to hold them in the palm of your hand, to carry them through whatever it is they have to go through in order to come to the other side, to begin to see a new day, new hope, and a new ending to a story they could not imagine for themselves. Bless them. Keep them, I pray, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Well, catch you next time. Thank you so much, Pastor Hamish, for that word. I loved it so much, and I'm sure you were blessed by it as well. Just a reminder, if you have any questions from today's word, you can ask them at slider.com and use the hashtag ALC24. I personally loved when Pastor Hamish uh, ended us with that point of God always has a great ending. I think it's so easy to allow um, our own things, our own plans to determine our ending, but God always has a better ending and a greater ending. So I encourage you to ponder upon that word after this. Don't just let it go here. Just something for you to take into the rest of the week. Um, But that is us for this week. We will be back next week with another great online service for you. Lewis, would you like to pray and wrap us up? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm encouraged by that and I hope you are too. Father, we thank you that you're here with us and for us. God, we thank you that you are the author of all things. Yes. Father, You, when we see disaster, you see opportunity. God, we know that you are here with us mm. in every moment. Father, when things seem rotten, you can make a way. Mm. And we just pray expectantly, trusting you in all that is said. I just pray over every single person. Will you bless them, strengthen yes, them, and Lord. lead them in your glory. Yes, and we Lord. thank you for all that you are doing in this day and in this generation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, have an incredible week, and we look forward to seeing you very soon.